want to answer three questions about SpySpy, -Spy, which is this my open source SpyFlash flash simulation. The big question is, you know, what is uh, the SpyFlash? flash? Why do we want to emulate it, and how are we going to do it? So the what is uh, the easy one. The, the spy flash are these small, uh, non-volatile memory chips on servers and laptops, most computers, that uh, are typically in 8-pin SOIC packages. And pulling up the, uh, the data sheet for them, we can see that spy is the serial peripheral interface. It's a really generic term for a basically three or four wire uh, connection. They tend to be pretty small. Uh, only about uh, 16 megabytes or so. And frequently, they're called the boot ROMs. That's a bit of a misnomer, since they're actually flash memory. And these have replaced the 64 kilobyte ROMs in the old machines. And that's allowed us to bring a lot more complexity into the firmware of our systems. Uh, you might be familiar with the closed source UEFI firmware on most computers that gives you uh, typically windowing and networking and a bunch of other uh, functionality before the OS is loaded. There are also open source firmwares like Linux Boot and Core Boot that allow people to uh, replace the firmware in those spy flashes with uh, free software that they can read and modify uh, to suit their own needs. So why do we want to emulate the spy flashes? Well, if you're working on core boot or Linux boot, or if you're doing security research into uh, UEFI, you end up having to reflash the chips quite frequently. And really, you end up doing this a lot. Um, in, in my career doing firmware research, I spend a lot of time hooking up flash programmers and waiting for the chips to flash. And you might think, well, it's only 16 megabytes. How long could it take to write this into, into the flash memory? And the problem is that these, these chips are uh, designed where you have to write them four kilobytes at a time, and you have to erase the sectors before you can write. And in the worst case, it takes 120 milliseconds to erase that sector, uh, each sector. So if we 120 milliseconds times 16 megabytes divided by 4K sector size, we're talking about eight minutes to write one of these chips uh, with new contents. And that's a really painful cycle time. So to give you an example of you know, what my usual day is with this sort of uh, system before SpySpy, -Spy, you know, you're finally finished building Core Boot, and you've got to turn off the power to the machine you're going to flash, because the SPY bus doesn't allow multiple devices to uh, to drive it. And then you typically you have to attach the flash programmer um, each time because you can't leave it connected due to uh, loading and capacitance issues. And then you can finally run the flash, pro flash ROM program to start flashing. The first section goes really fast, but that's because the, you haven't changed the management engine uh, region at all. So it can, it can just skip that. And then it hits the parts where it has to start erasing and rewriting. And yeah. And you know, the minutes go by. It's still you know, 28 kilobytes a second. It, it's just, uh, yeah. Um, you know, five minutes in, it, at some point you're just, you know, you're ready to go off and do something else. So when it's finally done after five and a half minutes and you know, 49 kilobytes average speed, you're not actually done. You now have to remove the flash programmer, power the system back on, and then you've got to do it all over again when you realize that you, know, you made uh, some uh, stupid mistake in building the image or something. So this is really painful. And as they say in the infomercials, there's got to be a better way. And that's what the SpySpy -Spy, uh, device is uh, for firmware developers. You attach it once uh, when you start doing firmware development, and then you leave it attached. When you go to upload the, uh, the new core boot image, and we're going to play this in real time as we, uh, as we upload the image. It's able to uh, copy the new core boot into the DRAM uh, on the SpySpy, -Spy, and uh, at basically limited by the speeds of the USB. So 
12 seconds versus five and a half minutes, that's not too bad. And we can actually do a little bit better because right now we're limited by the USB serial, uh, the, the uh, abstract um, communication uh, module or ACM. Um, but this is still just such an improvement. The other advantage is we can now do a soft reboot uh, into that new firmware. We don't have to get out of our chair to remove the programmer or to uh, turn the power supply on and off. So it's a huge, huge improvement. The other thing SpySpy gives us is insight into what happens when the computer boots. If you've just come to camp from the 1970s, you might think x86s still boot in real mode, uh, reading from uh, the top of the, uh, the flash memory. But it turns out that is not what happens on modern CPUs at all. Since SpySpy is watching the bus, it's able to give us sort of like a, a TCP dump style uh, list of everything that is read from the flash. And we can see that the, uh, the platform controller hub reads something from the Intel flash descriptor first from offset 10. We can see the Intel management engine uh, reads and validates its firmware. We can see that something in the x86, maybe some boot code, or excuse me, some boot ROM, or uh, perhaps microcode, reads and parses the fit table, the firmware interface table, which contains pointers to microcode updates that the, the x86 is then loads. And then finally, uh, it's still not time for the reset vector. It jumps into boot guard or some of the other secure boot methods. And if those validate the signature, Finally, the reset vector gets called, and then that does a jump into the BIOS or core boot or whatever. This is a lot of really useful insight, and we can also plot this data. And so if we make a plot of the addresses versus the uh, order in which they're read and color them uh, blue for the first time an address is read, this is typically when something like boot guard of the management engine is doing a signature check. So we would call this time of check. And then we can also color any addresses that are reread from the flash. Uh, and we can see that there are quite a few other time of use uh, reads. This talk towel sort of uh, issue can turn into a security vulnerability, which is what uh, Peter Bosch and I demonstrated at uh, hack in the box earlier this year, we're, we were able to bypass uh, Intel's boot guard through uh, using technology similar to SpySpy. Spy. So that's the, the what and the why. And because this is a technical conference, let's get deep into the how it actually works. And I want to point out that I say it's my project, but it's built on a lot of really uh, wonderful other open source projects, um, including the uh, the Yosis project Trellix and XPNR, uh, which was just talked about in the previous talk here. That th this group has produced a open source tool chain for FPGAs that's created an entire new ecosystem of uh, programmable hardware. Um, I also had some collaborators from uh, RevSpace, uh, Alyssa Milburn and uh, Peter Bourne, um, who uh, worked with me on the initial FPJ implementation, um, which is what we used for the Hack in the Box uh, demo. That, that was built on a much smaller FPGA, um, the ICE40 up 5K, which was also mentioned in the previous talk. This one has one megabit of block RAM, not enough to store an entire flash image, but it stores enough for the, um, uh, the time of check, time of use vulnerability. But we knew we, we were going to need a lot more memory. Luckily, there is a really neat uh, open source hardware project uh, out of the Radiana hackerspace in Croatia. Um, Amard uh, has built this one on the Lattice ECP5, and it includes a 32 megabyte uh, SD RAM that we can read and write to at around 250 megabytes a second. So we're able to benefit from the fact that this has the schematics published and it works with the open source tool chain. And we can build, uh, we can use this as the building block for our system. 
the next hurdle is that SDRAM is really complex, and it's filled with a lot of dark magic uh, inside the state transitions that you have to maintain. That's not exactly the state diagram, but it looks pretty similar to uh, the, the real one. And, you know, I, I don't know about you all, but I don't want to have to understand DRAM at that sort of level, and luckily I don't. Uh, Stefan Christensen published under a very permissive license uh, SDRAM controller that we were able to very quickly adapt to the open hardware ULX3 and build it with the open uh, source PGA toolchain. And that gave us a huge jump start. The other uh, thing is that most open source projects build on things that other people have published. In this case, Scanline uh, had already done a similar project for emulating Nintendo DS uh, save games. Uh, and she published all of her source code. So that was really helpful to learn about how the spy bus works and, what, uh, uh, and how to interface with it. So let's do a quick dive into how the spy bus works. Um, as I mentioned, there are these 8-pin SOIC chips. And uh, we can typically find in the data sheet the pinout and a timing diagram. Um, there's a red dot that indicates the, uh, the pin one. And we can then find the power and ground. We definitely don't want to mix those up. The chip select line is the next one that's important. And this is used from the platform controller hub or the x86 to uh, tell the chip that it wants to talk to it. And it goes low during the duration of the transaction. So we would call this an active low signal. And typically designate with either a bang or a hash in the name. Um, the clock is also generated by the x86 and fed into the spy flash. Um, on the falling edge of the clock, the values change. And then on the rising edges, uh, they need to be stable. So we would call this a rising edge clocked signal. The serial in pin uh, comes from the, from the x86 into the chip and contains the uh, command bytes that are going to be processed um, by the chip. And at the end of the commands, the flash will write its output onto the serial out uh, pin. So these four pins are the ones that we need to control. And uh, we need to understand what do the command bytes look like. So uh, the data sheet lists a lot of commands. Um, and the one that we most care about is the normal read. So this uh, three. And it tells us that there's going to be um, uh, then three address bytes that come after it, and that uh, the chip will output in bytes until CS goes high. So we pull up the, uh, the timing diagram from the data sheet. We can see there's the uh, command three on the serial in pin, followed by 24 bits in most significant bit first, followed then by uh, typically up to about 256 uh, response bytes. In the Toctal version on the IS-40, we basically said when we've received all 24 bits, read something from the block RAM, and send it out the spy port. But that worked there because block RAM is available in a single cycle. When we tried this with the DRAM, it didn't work. That the uh, real RAM, excuse me, the real uh, spy flash is in blue. And you can see that the first bit is delayed by about 50 nanoseconds before it takes on the correct value. And the reason for that is SDRAM isn't just an array that you can read from. You have to activate a row, and then you have to wait some number of clock cycles, and then you can send the column that you want to read from that row, and you have to wait some additional clock cycles. And this uh, total latency can be five to seven clock cycles, typically 50 to uh, 80 nanoseconds. It's really fascinating that even if we went to faster memory, this random read time doesn't change because the uh, cast latency goes up or the row activation latency goes up. 
that even with a 2400 um, or 2.4 gigahertz RAM, it's still about 50 to 100 nanoseconds. And the problem is that we need to have that result uh, ready roughly half a spy clock later. And the spy clock is around 20, uh, excuse me, 20 megahertz. So that's about 25 nanoseconds that we need to produce a result. What's wonderful about working with FPGAs is we're not limited by things like byte boundaries or limitations of uh, you know, sort of traditional programming languages. So we can, we can uh, start that row activation as soon as we've received 14 bits of the address. We can then start the column activation once we've received um, another nine bits of the address. We then get 16 bits back from the RAM, and we've been able to overlap all of this with the, uh, with the SPY transaction. So we can use that last bit to select either the upper or the lower byte of the 16. And this actually works. We're able to produce the first result, excuse me, the first bit, only a few nanoseconds slower than the real flash. And at 20 megahertz, we, we meet timing, and we can convince the PCH, the Platform Controller Hub, that th the flash is good when it sees this F8, excuse me, 5A, A5 uh, data, which is at offset 10 in our flash. Uh, Zeno and John Butterworth uh, tell us in their advanced BIOS training that this is the signature that the PCH is looking for to identify the flash. And if you don't have it, the system won't start up at all. It's just no sign of life whatsoever from the machine. So we can convince the PCH to start up, but sometimes the Linux kernel or uh, the boot guard or other things fail, typically with some sort of page read error. And the reason for that is another complexity in the DRAM. Uh, DRAM is actually built out of lots and lots of capacitors. And those capacitors are slowly discharging. So it's necessary for the SDRAM controller to periodically uh, refresh each row. And this means that every 7.8 microseconds, the SDRAM controller uh, will, will uh, prevent any reads or writes from happening, start a row refresh, and then nothing can happen for about 60 nanoseconds which is going to completely blow off our timing. Luckily, our SDRAM controller is open source. So we are able to modify it to add a, something that will inhibit the refresh when we're in a timing critical section during a spy read. And with all of those hacks together, this actually works, that we're able to um, support uh, boot all the way into, uh, into Linux. So you've seen in a lot of the photos, we're using these uh, solderless chip clips from um, Pomona. And you might be asking, how, does this how do we prevent the real flash chip from responding to these requests? It turns out that on most main boards, but not all, definitely check yours before you try this, the uh, this CS input on the spy flash goes through a small series resistor so that uh, it, it's sort of buffered from the uh, PCH's CS output. This means that we, this resistor means we can build essentially an OR gate where either the PCH or our device can drive that line high. So schematically, it looks something like this, where when a spy transaction starts, the uh, PCH or the x86 um, drives CS low, which wakes up the spy flash, and it will start to send data back on serial out. If the FPGA wants to take over this transaction, it can drive the line high, which will turn off the spy flash. So the spy flash will turn its serial output line driver off, 
And then the FPGA can assert the serial output line to send the data uh, in reply to the, the PCH. The drawback to this is we now don't know when the transaction is over. Um, so we've added another hack, which is that the FPGA is watching the clock line. And when it sees that some number of nanoseconds have gone by with no clock transitions, uh, it goes ahead and deasserts the, excuse me, it tri-states its CS output, which then uh, re returns the bus so that the PCH can, can take it over again next time. So huge pile of hacks, but it all works. We can boot uh, quite a few laptops. Uh, we've done it on a lot of servers. And uh, pretty much every system we've tried it on, we've found interesting uh, Toctile vulnerabilities. We've also been able to accelerate the firmware development for the groups that are using uh, these machines. One area where we really want to do some research is supporting other architectures. On that server, for instance, there's another spy flash right next to the x86s that stores the, the ARM uh, BMC, the board management controller uh, firmware. And if, if you want some more information about that, you can watch my CCC talk from last year about the uh, Supermicro BMC hacks. Um, unfortunately, the ARM uses some of the read commands that we don't currently support, which brings us to you know, we would love for you all to get involved in the project. Um, you know, if we can add some of the things that ARM needs, if we can add the, uh, these different read commands, uh, we can definitely improve the UI. It's very programmer-centric right now. Um, we'd also love to switch to either USB mass storage, which uh, was mentioned in the last talk, or perhaps uh, USB Ethernet. Um, and there's also a lot of other buses in the system that we can apply this to. The LPC, where the TPM lives, the eSpy is being used by things like the Apple T2 coprocessor, and also things like the MMC uh, for doing firmware uh, loads on embedded devices. So hopefully this has uh, answered your questions about the, the what, why, and how for SpySpy. Spy. If you want to get involved, you can check out all the source from our GitHub tree. Uh, we have a fairly active Slack channel as part of the open source firmware Slack. And you can also find me on uh, Mastodon or Twitter. And with that, I'd love to take any questions that you all might have about the project. Apologies about that. Um, there's about 15 minutes left for a Q&A, so go ahead. Are there SRAM chips that will work, or are they all too small? Most of the SRAM chips tend to be pretty small. Uh, also very expensive to build 32 megabytes of SRAM these days. Uh, for uh, Scanline's project, she used SRAM because she only used to emulate, um, I think, 128 kilobytes of, uh, of, of storage. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, usually there is a command to erase the whole flash, which is must, much faster than sector erase. Was that an option, or is it still too slow? It, it's still pretty slow. Um, because, well, a few reasons. Um, okay, so the whole chip erase command here is uh, 80 seconds. Um, typically, that is not an optimization because a lot of the chip hasn't changed. Uh, that would erase the management engine section, for instance, which, unless you're working on uh, security related to the, to the ME, is probably going to be the same between flashes. So a full chip erase would um, uh, require reprogramming all of that. And the page program time is uh, 1.5 milliseconds per 256 byte page. So I, I, think it's, I think overall it's a loss.
And the second question, and serial NAND flashes, is that a thing in these controllers? Typically not, and I'm not sure why. Um, the, there is a lot of interesting innovation happening uh, in some of the other chips, excuse me, some of the other uh, systems. Um, for instance, uh, Apple is using eSpy uh, to boot their systems now. And they have a, a security coprocessor that is acting much like the SpySpy -Spy, as a interposer between the x86 and the firmware. So the T2 is able to do all the signature validation prior to releasing x86 reset and allowing it to read that, um, that data. OK, next question. Hi, um, you had an ICE-40 based design before you moved to this design. What type of performance were you able to get out of that older version? And what precipitated the move to the ECP-5? So the ICE-40 was able to keep up just fine with the 20 megahertz SPI bus. Um, the, uh, it seems that the ECP-5 hardware has a much easier time of meeting a much easier um, uh, time of meeting the, meeting the timing requirements. We need to be at least six times the uh, SPI clock speed to interface with the SD RAM, um, because we need to be able to overlap all of the, uh, the SD RAM um, row activation and uh, CES latency. We couldn't get the ICE-40 to ever time even close to that. It was a, it was a challenge getting the ICE-40 to time at 48 megahertz which was just enough to keep up um, uh, w w due to the, I think, the two clock, uh, clock crossing domain uh, delay. Uh, yes, is the access pattern uh, of the uh, uh, predictables that you maybe use caching? So we looked into uh, trying to do that, and that is, that's, it is predictable in the case of uh, a given firmware, but not necessarily if you're doing um, uh, firmware development where you're changing that quite, quite frequently. The other uh, thing that we looked into was using uh, on the ICE-40 uh, up 5 k with one megabit of, uh, of block RAM, we could cache every first bit for an eight megabyte, uh, excuse me, for an, uh, is an eight megabyte uh, uh, ROM. Unfortunately, that's not quite big enough for a 16 meg ROM, and a lot of the systems that we're looking at now have 32 meg uh, spy flash chips. Um, and you know, we really didn't want to move to any of the proprietary FPGAs. Um, you know, I'm really appreciative for, for the work on uh, on USIS, Project Trellis, and Next PNR, it's really made FPGA development so much nicer. So, oh, uh, all right. So you might have talked about it, I might have missed it, but you talked about graphing the existence of TalkTow bugs. Were you ever able to implement them in the firmware and do differential swapping out of the, the firmware in the tool chain? Uh, yes. We were able to defeat Intel boot guard uh, through that. Um, there, uh, Peter Bosch and I gave a talk at Hack in the Box about it that goes into a lot of the details. Um, that particular vulnerability had to do with the fact that there's a brief window of opportunity when the CPU transitions from cache's RAM mode uh, to start executing from DRAM, that they have to disable caches, which means the next instruction gets fetched from the flash, which then turns the caches back on. So we had a one instruction window that uh, gave us a, a total boot card bypass. OK, any further questions? I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but uh, does the project support other instruction sets other than uh, the SPI flash which you uh, demonstrated, like from Wintop or any other manufacturers? 
It supports a lowest common denominator of spy flash commands. Um, basically, the uh, the JDEC read ID command, the 03 normal speed read, the um, uh, the serial flash descriptor protocol. I don't know SFDP, um, which modern Intel chipsets require to be able to boot from from the spy flash. Uh, it also has preliminary support for write support um, and page erase support, uh, although right now we're, we're kind of winging that. Um, patches are, are always welcome. Okay, next question. Uh, you've described that uh, some mainboards have the series resistor, which allows you to override the chip select. Uh, what would you do if a mainboard doesn't have one? Uh, if the main board doesn't have one, it's necessary to uh, desolder the chip select pin, um, that pin number one from the um, uh, from the, the the flash on the board, bend it out of the way, and then put a jumper underneath it so that you can essentially um, break the connection between the flash chip and the main board. Any additional questions? Signal Angel? None? Okay. Well, in this case, we're done. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, thank you all.